Well, what an honor to be back here in uh, Kuala Lumpur. We always look forward to getting back here whenever we can. As the years go by, I never know when we'll be able to return to what place uh, because uh, the calendar gets so full so early. But I do consider Daniel one of my very dear and loyal, trusted friends and his wife, Doris. We've enjoyed some marvelous meals together. The only problem is when I come here, it's very difficult to go back home and tell people that you are working hard <laughs> because once they take you to Kannas and your midriff gets more globular, you just uh, have a very difficult time with all the good food out here to say, yeah, we've had a tough journey. We had a real tough journey. So last night I didn't email anybody uh, because it would be unfair to say it's been a long day. It has actually been a wonderful day. Uh, we were in Manila before this and Shanghai before that and on to Jakarta first thing early tomorrow morning, three days or four days in Jakarta, then to Singapore and then uh, on to Oxford to uh, address our graduating class at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. I think I told you that yesterday we get home, do a couple of days at Wheaton and then on to Bangalore. I was telling my colleagues while we were driving in this morning that many years ago, I remember speaking in Auckland, New Zealand on a Sunday morning. My wife was with me and our little girl. We took a flight out immediately after that, many, many hours of flying, and I spoke on the same Sunday morning service in Honolulu on the same calendar day. Uh, nobody could believe you could do this once upon a time, but nobody believed there would be such maniacs who would try to do this once upon a time. Uh, the life that we now lead has challenges, has privileges. One of the reasons I really do this is because in the world in which we live, this is an extraordinary moment of tension and possibilities. It's exactly the way we see it. Incredible uncertainty economically, socially, morally, familiarly for the families of uh, uh, our world. It's a very tough time. It's almost like a coming together of the great storm in terms of certainty. Very few politicians uh, can really look you in the eye and tell you that in the immediate future, they see some bright spots. Maybe in the distant future, but in the immediate future, things look rather bleak people living beyond their means and so on. Certainly in North America, that's the way we've been carrying on. But at the same time, the opportunities to address especially the young are extraordinary. I was telling an audience recently that um, we did an open forum at UCLA. And when you think of that campus in Los Angeles, one of the most liberal institutions, they had asked me to speak on tolerance, whether it is really possible anymore. It was a midweek session, over 3,000 jammed the auditorium and overflow rooms had to be opened up. A little while before that at Clemson University, they had 7,000 I think on a Thursday night. The year before that, Arizona State University, we had 9,000 on a weeknight packing it out. This is incredible. You'd think the university student would be blasé and totally indifferent to these issues, but it's not so. Most of them are very sincere in hungering for answers. I'm very grateful to God for your church, what you do, how you do it, why you do it, and the continued presence of God in this congregation. I promise we'll be praying for you, and may the Lord continue to use you and multiply the impact of this work globally, especially under the leadership of Daniel, who is so well respected all over the globe. May God give you a wonderful team, and I pray that as we pray for you, you will pray for us, because we too crisscross this globe, and we are on the same team with the same vision in different venues, and the time is critical for, for, have, for having definitions. I want to just give you one little bit of a story here and then move into my message that I'm calling uh, Interpreting Failures and Conserving Victories. Interpreting Failures and Conserving Victories. But let me throw it back for a moment on something I want to share with you that is very defining for myself, and that is this. When I was at Princeton University just a few weeks ago, again, packed auditorium, 
one of the students stood up and asked this question. He said, what is the difference between the way things were in the original created order and now? I was not quite sure why he was asking that question, whether he was asking it in order to um, really get a different perspective on the two or whether he had some other issues in his mind. I don't know. But I said to him, there were two things in the first, in the dawn of creation. God walked with his creation in close proximity. That idea of fellowship and presence was truly a very precious thing. Presence and fellowship. Because the most intimate search in the human heart is the search for ultimate intimacy in the very reason for your creation. But then I said there was a second thing. I said, think about it. There was only one restriction, one prohibition, just one law. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because in the day that you shall eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be as God knowing good and evil, which I interpret to mean this, you will play God and start defining good and evil. You will act as if you are God and you will start defining good and evil. I said, take a look at our world today and I ask you if you see the difference between the time God was defining good and evil and the time now when we have started to define good and evil. And the world is in total chaos and we need hundreds of laws, thousands of laws, footnotes to laws, redefining of all kinds of words. In America, just to do our health care program, we needed 2,000 pages. Why? Because every statement can be redefined. I often use the illustration, when you get onto a plane, what do they tell you? Do not tamper, touch, disable, or destroy the smoke detector. Why do you need four descriptions for that? Temper, touch, disable, or destroy. You can just say it in one line. There's a smoke detector in the, in the, in the uh, washrooms, folks. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. But why? Because in a court of law, you can redefine every little word. Every little word. And try to exonerate yourself. God gives us simplicity with sublimity. And when you live by his definitions, life becomes a beautiful pattern unfolded by the grand weaver. When we start putting our own definitions, we mess things up. So it took Moses 613 laws to expand upon that one law. I want to give you today a very simple message. I know when I begin that way, people say, don't believe him. But I'm going to try and make it as simple as I can. But I want to also expand on each thought to put it in a larger picture. God has given you and me a blueprint for life and a blueprint for nations. A blueprint for life and a blueprint for nations. What does God expect of a nation? What does God expect in your life? He gives it to us very clearly and I would like to read this passage for you from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy literally comes from two Greek words, deuteros, nomos, the reiteration of the law. Nomos is the word for law. The reiteration of the law given in Exodus, reiterated in Deuteronomy. Listen to what he says in chapter 8. And one more thing I should say. God, Jesus, when he was speaking and in his incarnation, quoted more from this particular book than any other book, so it's called a favored book of Jesus. This chapter, he quoted three of the main ideas from this chapter when he faced the temptation in the wilderness. All of his three responses to the devil come from this particular chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you in the way, all the way in the desert these 
40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you. Why? Causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. Why did he do that? Two, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Then he goes on to say, if you violate these three principles I'm giving you, you will see the kind of judgment that would ensue. What are the three thoughts he left with them? You see, the journey of the Exodus was a tough one. They were in bondage. They had gone into slavery. And now through a plurality of miracles, God was opening up the way to redeem them and rescue them. The pattern for God is always like this. First redemption, then righteousness, then worship. You cannot change that logical sequence. You move from redemption out of slavery into righteousness, the moral law. You don't earn your righteousness. The righteousness you live by is the demonstration of your redemption. Redemption, righteousness, and worship. That's the sequence that God has given here. Brings them out of bondage, then reveals to them the moral law in Sinai, and ultimately gives them the pattern for the tabernacle and the temple. That redemptive process, that deliverance ought not to have taken more than four to six weeks. Maximum. Even with the large numbers. You can look at the geography and know that within a month to six weeks he could have, they could have followed the, 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 the map and come all the way into the promised land. Instead of four to six weeks it took them 40 years. A whole generation had come and gone and was lost in the wilderness. Let me pause and say something very simple to you. The shortest route may not always be the best route because it will bypass some of the more important lessons in life that God wants to teach you. The shortest route may not always be the best route because oftentimes it bypasses the most important lessons God wants to teach you. You know, when a, mo when a mo woman conceives a child, it would be pretty simple, wouldn't it, for God to one week later bring that child to be born. It's already a miracle. Why does he give that pure period of gestation for about nine months to prepare the body of the mother, to prepare the body of the child? These are the great mysteries that God reveals to us where time is an important component in preparing you for what he wants to do in you and through you. Time is an important component, a very important component. And this time that God prepares for you and for me has a pattern and a process. What does he do? He wants them to teach, learn three things. The first thing is so that you would see in your own heart what you are really like. He took them for 40 years so that in that four decades they would see how wicked and undeserving they really were. What's the first lesson he wanted to teach them? Humility, the humbleness of spirit and a humble heart. Did you hear, ever hear of the preacher who said to the audience, I really wanted to speak to you on humility today, but I think I'll save it for a larger audience. Yeah, get it. I want to speak to you on humility, but I think I'll save it for a larger crowd. So often, pride comes in the way of the human heart, even in a preparation of a sermon where he wants to save the best for a larger audience. And Jesus oftentimes saved some of his most powerful statements for an audience of one. Humility of heart to humble you and teach you what was in your heart. There are two ways in which you will learn humility. There are two ways in which you will learn it. It's the simpler way of looking at the person of Christ, who being in the form of God, 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Christ life looking at the person of Jesus. You know, I think it was the great Scottish preacher by the name of uh, James Stewart who put together this, this extraordinary statement. It's uh, years ago, I'd memorized, tried to remember it. I'm not sure I will. But he said something like this. He was the meekest and lowliest of all the sons of men, yet he spoke of coming on the clouds of heaven with the glory of God. He was so austere that evil spirits and demons cried out in terror at his coming. Yet he was so genial and winsome and approachable that the little ones loved to nestle with him and nestle in his arms. His presence at the innocent gaiety of a village wedding was like the presence of sunshine. A bruised reed he would not break. His whole life was love. Yet on one occasion he demanded of the Pharisees how they were expected to escape the damnation of hell. He was a dreamer of dreams and a seer of visions. Yet for sheer stark reality, he has all of our self-styled realists soundly beaten. He was the servant of all, washing the disciples' feet. Yet masterfully he strode into the temple and the hucksters and money changers fled from his presence as they saw the fire in his eyes. He saved others, yet himself he did not save. There is nothing in history like the union of contrasts which confronts us in the Gospels. The mystery of Jesus is the mystery of divine personality. This union of contrasts, this startling coalescence of contrarieties. Dreamer of dreams and seer of visions. Yet for sheer sure stark reality, he has all of our self-styled realists soundly beaten. Doesn't compare anymore. The King of kings and the Lord of lords who gets on his knees with a basin of water and a towel to wash the feet of his disciples. Humility. Do you know it? Are you aware of how weak you really are and how fragile your life really is? I've seen it come again and again. I remember in my studies in English literature at Cambridge studying the life of one of the great poets I admired, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He messed up his life with drugs, ruined it with opium till he was trying to sit at a desk and write more poetry. And he worked, he's the one who wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Mariner and Kubla Khan and all of that. And that gift went from him till he begged his own genius to come up with it one more time. And he sat at the desk, pen in hand, and couldn't write one sentence anymore. It was gone, it was gone. We're very fragile, we're very weak. Things happen and as the years go by, you realize the virility of youth, the strength of youth is there just for a short season and all of a sudden, the keepers of the frame begin to tremble. And you realize that. I have uh, had a very dear friend by the name of John Wesley White. Billy Graham referred to him as the most brilliant evangelist on his team. The most brilliant evangelist. John Wesley White actually helped Dr. Dura Graham write many of his early books. I remember teaming up with Dr. White many times. He makes his home in Toronto, Canada. And all of a sudden, one day, I got a telephone call to see if I would give him a call because he had suffered a major stroke, a major stroke. And uh, I was asked if I would call him, and he was still recovering from it. And I made that call and spoke to his wife on the phone and she said, Ravi, you'll be thrilled to hear your voice. So she gave him the, 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 the telephone and I said, John, this is Ravi. Yes. I said, I'm so sorry, John, <clears throat> to hear what's happened to you. Yes. 
And the whole conversation was with me with sentences and him with one word, yes. My colleagues who are here with me, we dearly love one of our own colleagues. His name is Prakash. He's in Chennai. Prakash was the first associate from India that joined our team. My brother Ruben went to visit him recently, and he, Prakash has contracted a rather dreadful disease. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it. There's a strange way to pronounce it, but something like a Guillaume Barre syndrome, but that's not exactly the way to pronounce it. And it's an ascending paralysis. Starts off from the feet, moves upwards, and can ultimately choke and paralyze you. Just came upon him like that. Our life contains a thousand springs and dies if one be gone. Strange that a harp of a thousand strings can stay in tune so long. We are fragile. We are weak. The best of our minds can go. The best of our health can go. And I challenge you to remember your fragility, but most importantly, the, 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 the poverty of your soul. Without God, you can't make it. And so he says, remember, what is in your heart? Take a look at your own heart. Have you done that? Have you seen the poverty of your own heart? God wants to teach you humility. And you know, without a Redeemer, you and I cannot make it. Without the indwelling presence of God, you cannot make it. I've been in the ministry 41 years. Temptation may still stalk. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, lust, greed, pride, stalks all of us. All of us. And unless you know how vulnerable you are, you will never come to him for saving grace. God alone knows how to humble you without humiliating you and how to exalt you without, without flattering you. He alone knows how to humble you without humiliating you and how to exalt you without flattering you. Those are the words of the famed speaker, E.M. Blakelock. I've often reminded myself of that. Humility. You can either learn it by observing the life of Christ and learning from him, or you can do it the hard way by stumbling into sin and finding yourself shattered by it till that reminds you, you are not God. You're not who you think you are. I'm coming from a set of meetings in Manila where there was a handsome young man who stood up and confessed, and he said, I may as well be transparent before this audience. They all knew who he was. I don't know who he was. I don't live in the Philippines. But he was an actor. He was a popular man. Everything was hunky-dory. Everything was right. He was riding the crest of success till something happened that shattered him in the public image. And you know what he said to me when he was talking to us in a small group? He says, I'm living with so much shame now. I am so ashamed. He said, I don't know what to do. Maybe my only hope. And the people just surrounding, listening to him. The tragedy of a broken life that did not move in the right direction. But thankfully, God's grace is still sufficient. He can bring you back. He can turn you around. Thomas Aquinas said this, which is rather powerful. But Aquinas' major point that he actually makes elsewhere, I haven't uh, written it down carefully here. I thought it, I had it here somewhere near on hand. But here it is. Aquinas says this. Listen to him carefully. Writing centuries ago. First time I read it, I was not sure what to make of it. But now I believe he's saying the truth. He says this, in order to overcome their pride, God punishes certain people by allowing them to fall into sins of the flesh, which even though in actuality before God, they are less grievous, but in the human environment, it is more shameful. From this indeed, the gravity of pride is made manifest. For just as a wise physician, in order to cure a worse disease, allows the patient to contract a lesser one that is less dangerous, so is the sin of pride shown to be more grievous by the very fact that as a remedy, God allows some people to fall into lesser sins in order to awaken them to the deeper sins of pride. To the deeper sin of pride. That's Aquinas. And so God's goal is to bring you to himself, humility. But there's a second principle here. It's spirituality. How to feed and nurture the reality of the soul. 
And this is the reality that God wants for you and me. The deep sense of what is spiritual and true. God wants you to have a relationship with him. That's the beginning of all wisdom. That relationship which is not merely abstract, but that relationship which knows God and serves him, the truly spiritual. This is the longing of your heart and mine. You know, there are many hungers in your life. There's physical hungers, there's aesthetic hungers, there are spiritual hungers, there are divine hungers. Physical, aesthetic, spiritual, divine. Hungers that God plants in you that only God is big enough to fill. I want to point two things to you here in an illustration and move to my final thought. Some years ago, I was visiting Lebanon. Lebanon used to be one of my favorite haunts, even in the day where you really couldn't get in. You'd have to go to Cyprus, take a boat, 12 hours journey by night to Junie, and I would be picked up out there. On one of these trips, it was just a, a raucous trip because there was a wild storm on the high seas. And we were just literally in the boat. It was called the sunny boat. I want you to know there was nothing sunny about it and it was hardly a boat. And we were doing 12 hours of this journey. I had to lie down to keep from being continually sick. And my notes and my Bible and my things were scattered all over the floor. You couldn't keep it. The boat was just rocking like this. And when I got up in the morning and it had calmed down and I went up to see what time we were disembarking, everybody looked like they'd really been beaten up that night. They'd all had it. We all wanted to get off. And so we got off that boat and somehow I made it and started to have the meetings. And then the dreaded thing was I had to take that boat back to, to, to uh, Cyprus. I was dreading this whole thing, but something happened, uh, actually a lot, it's a long story, I won't go into details, they were not going to let me off the boat, they let everybody else off, they weren't going to let me off. And a big burly guy by the name of Antoine said, are you evangelical? And I want to know what this boy is up to, he wasn't going to let me off. And then finally, when he looked at me, let me off the boat, I said, you know, keep me here, I'll leave tomorrow and so on. And then he puts me into a car taxi and has a guy in the front seat with the barrel of a gun staring at me and I'm sitting in the back seat. And Antoine is sitting next to me. And he said, you haven't answered my question, are you evangelical? I said, I thought I did. That's why I'm here. Yes, I'm an evangelical, I'm here to speak. And then he leeches out, holds my hand and he says, I am too, welcome to my country. <laughs> I said, what was this all about? You know, what is this all about? And then a long story, but they let me out and my host was Sammy Dagger. If you've never been with Sammy Dagger, this side of heaven, you have missed something. He's short as a teddy bear, but he's, pardon the analogy, is like a packet of dynamite. He doesn't even say good morning without expending more energy than I would in a sermon. How are you, my brother? And he gives you that big hug. Sammy knows no fear. And his wife is English. He's Lebanese, his wife is English. Her name is Joy. She needed to have that name to put up with this guy. <laughs> and here's the story. They are driving at 11 o'clock at night and he sees a suitcase on the side of the highway sitting unattended. Only Sammy would think of getting off the car to check on it. He says, darling, there is a suitcase on the side of the road. She says, Sammy, it's not ours. In any part of Lebanon, you don't check somebody else's suitcase on the side of the road, unless you're Sammy. And he gets off and he pats it. He says, darling, it's full. She says, Sammy, leave it alone. He says, somebody must have lost it. She said, obviously. He picks it up and puts it into their van. And she's having kittens heading back home while he's celebrating that he's found somebody's suitcase. He takes it into the house and she leaves the room. He opens it. Do you know what he sees there? Every square inch, money. 
Nobody ever has that experience and says, Why me, Lord? <laughs> he dumps the money out and he sees a business card. And he looks at the telephone number and it's about midnight he phones and a voice picks it up. And Sammy says to him, Are you Mr. So-and-so? And he said, Yes, why are you calling? He says, Have you lost anything? That man is in pin drop silence. He says, have you found it? <laughs> he says, yes, on the side of the road. He says, it's full of money. He says, yes, I was trying to leave the country, emptied my bank account, put it in a suitcase and tied it on the top of my car and I'm heading to the airport and it must have blown off. When I came back, I couldn't find it. Sammy says, I have it. And I don't think anything is missing. There's no room. It's full. The man is so shocked. He says, can I come? He said, no, 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 it's curfew now. If I had any other plans for your suitcase, I wouldn't be calling you. He says, you come tomorrow morning. This is my address. Pick it up. So the guy comes the next morning, picks it up. He's stunned that a man has turned in this kind of money. So he dips in and he lifts this money and he says, you're a pastor? He says, yes. He says, give this to your church. Sammy says, I only take an offering like this on Sundays. You come to church on Sunday and you put it in your side. <laughs> so the guy comes to church and he puts that money in. He can't get over it. The night I was leaving, this man had come with his family and Sammy was hosting him for tea and then he was taking me to the port. And I'm sitting there while they're talking in their language and Sammy keeps interpreting. And then at one point, Sammy takes a Bible for him, for this man's wife, for his children. He has a Bible. And here's what he said. You thought you had lost your treasure. He said, who really wants Lebanese money? <laughs> he said, you thought this was treasure? He said, I'll give you the treasure that moth will not devour, that thieves cannot break into steel. And he gave every one of them a Bible. This man could not stop weeping. And the tears are running down his face. He takes that Bible and kisses it and holds it against his arm. And I watched as Sammy had the privilege of praying with this family and giving them the greatest treasure they could ever own, the Word of God. This is it. This is it. This is what Jesus quoted to resist the devil and said, Be gone, it is written. Be gone, it is written. Be gone, it is written. This is God's word. This is his truth. Matt and I were in Moscow recently. And there were people in the front row who had served years and years in prison for reading this. Last time I was there, a little over a year ago, when I was introduced to the over a thousand pastors sitting in front of me and their spouses and young people. You know how I was introduced? They said if my brother had come here 20 years ago, the only Bible he would have found would have been in the museum. Today there's over a thousand Bibles here in this auditorium alone. The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Thy Word is truth and your scriptures cannot be broken, says David. I give to you this. You want to know what true spirituality is? Turn to this word. You want to know what the real bread of life is? Turn to this word. And the second thing I say to you is not only is it propositional, it is relational. There are many things I could say to you, and many things I could say to you, and maybe I'll just cut through the muster here quickly. Those of you who've read my story walking from east to west will know that I had a tough relationship with my dad. And in our culture, my culture and Indian culture, I know many of you are Indians sitting here and uh, some of you may know my family. When I wrote it, I sent it to my brothers and sisters and I said, have I been hard on dad in this book? They wrote back and said, no, Rav, you've been, you've been, you've been actually very fair and you could have said a lot more you didn't. But I always say this, 
Christ brought me to himself on a bed of suicide. And years later, he brought my father to himself. And my dad, who had given me a tough life, and out of us five kids, was hardest on me. He would say that to you if he were here today. Say it without any mistake. When he was going in for open heart surgery in Toronto, Canada, and he was not physically ready for it, he was overweight, he had all the issues that they should have waited and prepared these in the early days of heart surgery in, in the 70s. But I lived in Niagara Falls, Ontario, with my family, and my dad was living in Toronto. All my other brothers and sisters were in Toronto. He gets on the phone and phones me in Niagara Falls, which is 75 miles away. And he said, when I go in for my heart surgery, son, would you drive me? I knew there was something up, why he asked me. I said, Dad, I'd love to. So I drove to Toronto early that morning, picked him up, and I took him to the hospital, and he wanted some time alone with me. Out of us five kids, he was closest to my oldest brother. And he was very close to the other three. I was the one from whom the distance was the greatest. And he asked for me. And as I drove him, and I was watching him wheeled in, he had a talk with me. And in that talk, what a father said to a son is very private. But you know what? The most important thing was he saw the shortcoming of where he had failed in the earlier days and just wanted to make things right. That's all. Because I knew the Lord, he knew the Lord. I never thought I would never see him alive again. And all I say to you is, God has his appointments, God has his times, God has his healings, God has his restorations. And the most important thing is when that truth is combined with spiritual transformation, he pours out his grace without measure. And that grace is a gift of God for a father and a son to have this cordial, close conversation alone, minutes before he goes. Only God could have made that possible. I say to you, do you know your heavenly Father? Do you know him? When he changes you and changes others around you, all your relationships are rebuilt. All your relationships are transformed. Humility, spirituality, and ultimately faith. These are the three principles by which he wants you to be governed. Humility, spirituality, faith. Now, I want to say a couple of things about faith. Faith is not credulity. It's not stupidity. It's not like you'd have no reason for what you believe in. In fact, we have very good reasons for what we believe in. Why Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. We have very good reasons for that. All of the prophecies for hundreds of years... All of the purity with his impeccable life. All of the prediction for his crucifixion. All of the struggle before that crucifixion. And then the promise of the bodily resurrection from the dead. And how he would build his church. And the gates of hell would not be able to, pray, to prevail against it. All of these promises come together. Hundreds of them in the person of Jesus Christ. But when you see that and see the reasoning behind it. You see the contrast and the credulity of the world. I remember in my days at Cambridge studying under a quantum physicist, John Pokinghorn, who had lecture after lecture after lecture on the incredible fine-tuning of the universe. How it took such specificity, such complexity, such little margin of error to even make it possible for your life and mine to exist. One slight fraction off and we wouldn't be here. So precise is the fine tuning that scientists who are even skeptics will say, you wind back the clock and start all over again, it'll never happen. Let me give you just one example. The enzymatic makeup of your body, the enzymes. Two skeptics, Sir Frederick Hoyle, the astronomer, and the mathematician Chandra Vikramasinghe from Sri Lanka. Chandra Vikramasinghe was at Cardiff, Hoyle at Cambridge. They co-authored a lot of stuff. And you know what they said? The enzymatic makeup is so incredible that Vikramasinghe came, who's a Buddhist by profession, which is non-theistic, 
But Chandra Vikrama Singha and Hoyle came up with this conclusion that the possibility of the enzymes coming together, it's, it's some tough words here, I won't go into them. In time, through time, diachronic, synchronic, all of this stuff they come up with. But they basically say this, it is mathematically so unbelievable that the possibility of it happening by accident, he said, would be 1 in 10 to the power of 40,000. That's 1 followed by 40,000 zeros. And here's what they say. You know, even in the known universe, there's only 1 in 10 to the power of 80 atoms. And so for the enzymatic makeup to have 1 in the possibility of 10 to the power of 40,000, in an understatement, they say, mathematically, it's impossible. That's just the enzymes. So here's what Frederick Hoyle says, which means it needed something with complexity to start with. And so you know what he did? He believes in the panspermia theory that a spaceship or something from another planet brought some spores to seed the earth. That's how it all got started. They tell me I have faith. <laughs> spaceship. A five-year-old boy could probably say, who made the spaceship? <laughs> who made the spores? He's not the only one. Sir Francis Crick, who got the Nobel Prize for cracking the code of the DNA, he said he believes some spores were brought from another planet to see the earth. That's how he explained it. There are three point one. If I told you that a dictionary developed because of an explosion in a printing press, would you believe me? That's only 26 letters of the alphabet to compute, compose a dictionary, and you would laugh at me if I said it happened by... In fact, even, even Sir Frederick Hoyle said, actually, we are trying to believe that it is possible for a jumbo 747 to come together because a tornado goes through a junkyard. His words. How many letters in your DNA? 3.1 billion bits of information. Faith, not credulity. There's a grand designer, there's a grand weaver. Humility, spirituality, faith. I want to close with this simple little illustration and bring it all together for you. It is something like this, very simple. It's this. When God asked Noah to build the ark, he gave him every detail every detail. But there were two things that were not there. There was no sail and there was no rudder, which means he could not control it. Have you ever thought of that? All the details, no sail and no rudder. He could not control it. There will come a time in your life where you'll have to say, I have no sail, I have no rudder, I turn my life completely onto you. I remember sitting next to a fellow once when our airplane was in trouble <clears throat> and they couldn't get the landing gear down. And he said, that's what I hate about flying, I'm not in control. I said, when you get off this plane, you really think you're going to be in control? A lot of people are ready to pray when the plane cannot land. Because they find out they're not in control. I got news for you. You're not in control of your life either. Oh, certain things you may. You had no decision on your DNA. You have no decision on the final moment of your life unless you choose to violate the sacredness of the trust God has given to you. I want to tell you, I love watching my little grandson because I now can enjoy a child without the major responsibility of a child. <laughs> but the moment he sees me, in fact, my daughter has been writing, Dad, he keeps saying, when am I going to see Papa? When am I going to see Papa? You know, calls me Papa. The moment he sees me, 
he puts his arms out and rests his weight completely in my arms, as he does with his parents and with his grandma. Whether they're awake or asleep, their weight is completely in your arms. That's faith. It's faith. Why? Because he knows you love him. You can know that about Christ today. You can know that about God. Humility, spirituality, and faith. And I just say to you, are you willing to cast your care upon him? Here's the closing illustration. In Delhi, when I was growing up, I was reading a little story in Hindi. It was called Dhan Tumare Pas Hai. In Hindi, that means the wealth is very close to you. Dhan, wealth, tumare paas, near you, hai is the verb to be. Dhan tumare paas hai. It's a story of a very wealthy pearl merchant, diamond merchant, who used to take a journey to his home village every year and would take his most precious diamonds, put it into a bag. A thief used to watch him doing this and one year decided to track him and he was going to steal all those jewels. The rich man was smart. He knew what the boy was up to. And they used to have to spend the night in an inn every night and continue the journey the next day. The rich man knew what this was about, so they'd go into the dharamsala, into the inn, and uh, they'd be given a mat and a pillow and a basin. And they would be given that basin of water to go out and wash up and then come and lie down. The rich man would always tell the thief, would be thief, why don't you go and wash first? When you've finished washing, come back, I'll take the basin and then I'll take my turn. And when the thief would go out and wash up, the rich man would take all of his jewels and put it under the pillow of the thief. All the precious stones under the pillow of the thief. And then the rich man would go and wash up and the thief would quickly rummage around the bags of the rich man, look under the pillow of the rich man, look under the mat of the rich man, for the life of him, he couldn't figure out where these jewels were. The one place he never looked was under his own pillow. On the last day, the rich man was leaving him, gave him a big hug and a namaste, and he says, I know what you're looking for. You were looking for my jewels, weren't you? He said, you looked in my bag, you looked in my pockets, you looked under my pillow, you looked under the mat. You never looked under your own pillow. Dhan, tamara pastha, tamare pastha. The dhan was nearer to you. The wealth was nearer to you than you ever realized. And he said, just remember that. Dhan, tamare pastha. The wealth is very near you. You don't have to go and run up 5,000 stairs somewhere. You don't have to go and buy it. You don't have to go and pay for it. You can cry out to Christ where you are. He is nearer to you than you realize. The wealth. Humility, spirituality, faith. That's the picture for a nation. That's the picture for an individual.